Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. I hope that you are all having a wonderful day. Before I get started, uh, please remember to like this video and to comment and to subscribe and turn on the notification bell and to share it with anybody who, whom you think may find it interesting. Also a huge, huge thank you to the people who support this channel on Patreon. I'm gonna leave their names listed at the very end. If you would also like to support this channel on Patreon, I'm gonna leave a link in the description. No hard feelings if you can't, I understand money being tight, but there will be hard feelings if you don't follow me on Instagram because Instagram is free. Instagram is also linked down below. I'm also gonna leave my email down below in case you need to contact me. I was recently approached by a woman whom I met a year or so ago at a meeting of the local costuming society with which I'm tangentially involved. I go to some of their stuff, but I'm not, I'm not a very active member. But she had a jewelry table there. She was selling antique jewelry and she remembered me. And she lives near my law school. So she saw me walking to my car one day after classes and she pulled over and said, hey, I work for this charity. It's called Rosehaven and it's designed to help women, children, and marginalized genders who are experiencing homelessness and poverty. And part of that involves providing them with clothing and jewelry and things that will help them to get a footing in the world and hopefully, you know, be able to perform well in job interviews. Most of the jewelry that they get donated ends up going to the women who come to the shelter. Some of the more expensive stuff, you know, the stuff with gems and gold and whatever, will be sold and then the money will be to put towards the cause. But then there are some pieces of antique jewelry that are not necessarily expensive, so they can't really be sold off. And even if they could be, she wouldn't want these pieces of history to be melted down for their value in gold. And the shelter is not hurting for jewelry. They've got boxes, but they've got more jewelry than they know what to do with. So she decided that she wanted this antique jewelry to go to somebody who would really appreciate it, which is where I come in. So she sold me a significant quantity of Victorian and Edwardian jewelry. I made a donation to Rosehaven in payment for this jewelry. And I thought that this would be a fun video to go through and unbox the stuff that I purchased from her and show it off because there are some absolutely incredible pieces. I'm actually, these earrings <laughs> are some of the pieces that I, that I bought from her. I'm gonna leave the link to the Rosehaven website down below. If you want to donate, it is a wonderful, charity with a wonderful cause. This is not the first time that I've seen these pieces of jewelry. I went through and selected them and then I have polished them all up and, and you know, got them looking their best for their debut onto the internet. So I hope you enjoy. Let's start with the necklaces. To begin with, this one, this is a reproduction. This is not actually Victorian, but it's a very good ape of the Etruscan revival style that they had going on and it's set in the gold tone I think this is a brass and it's black enameled and it's just a very simple choker now this is very very interesting I believe this dates to around 1910 and it's set in brass I believe and I'm not sure what these are these sort of star shaped they're they're not actual stones they are definitely man-made and they were not they would not have been very expensive and this is not an expensive necklace which is why i find it so interesting and why i love it so much it's it's a cheap piece of jewelry but these little star-shaped things if anybody knows what those are called i would really appreciate being told because i just find them so fascinating this one also dates from likely around 1910 maybe a little bit earlier and it's also not a very valuable piece. I, what's, this is, it's in the style of something like I've seen necklaces in this style made out of, you know, gold and, and diamonds, or whatever. This one appears to be made out of, once again, brass and glass. It's aping the style of a far more expensive piece of jewelry, but it is made on the cheap, which I think is just so interesting. By far, my favorite necklace that she gave me is this. Look at that. This is silver and amethyst. I believe it could be glass, amethyst colored. This dates from, it's kind of difficult to tell actually, this filigree work, I'm, I'm not a great expert in, in dating this kind of filigree. I'm guessing it's from early 1900s, maybe late 1800s, but I really don't know. If you have any guesses, please let me know. But is that not just gorgeous? And look at the chain too. 
This was very exciting for me to find. These are called pools of light. And it's a style of jewelry. It's made out of rock crystal. It's been cut in this, or not cut, but polished into these oval sort of flat disc things. Sometimes they're spheres. These ones are not. And technically pools of light are, that term only refers to jewelry that isn't actually made out of rock crystal. It's oftentimes, you'll find apes of this made out of glass. I believe this one is actually rock crystal because it is uh, very heavy and very cold to the touch. But I've been wanting a, a pool of light something for a long time. And I just think this is so incredible. These were made, they, they started being made in the 18th century and they were made, I mean, I, they still make them now. Oftentimes you'll see them listed as being Art Deco or 1920s, but that's not necessarily always the case. I don't know when this one is from. It's a pretty timeless looking thing. I mean, it's difficult to do much, to like change the styling of clear spheres very much. So the styles didn't really change all that much, but I just think that those are so pretty. Now this is elephant ivory. Elephant ivory cannot be bought or sold in the United States anymore unless you can prove its provenance, you can prove that it's old. Can None of this can have its provenance proved. It is all old, but there's no you know, documentation to support that. So it couldn't be sold. So technically it's not worth anything. And it, it's quite barbaric, I think. But also it is quite beautiful. And I feel what I, what I say when people ask me how I can wear furs is I feel as though if somebody killed me to make a coat out of me, I would hope that they would at least wear it because otherwise I died for nothing. Killing elephants for their ivory is barbaric and I do not support it. However, I feel as though just leaving elephant ivory sitting away in some dusty box and letting it molder, I mean, then the elephant died for nothing. So it's a, it's a touchy subject. It's not the kind of thing that I would wear frequently, but I'm not categorically morally opposed to wearing elephant ivory if it already existed. But tell me your thoughts about this down below because I've heard interesting arguments on both sides. I, I, have, I have mixed feelings about this elephant ivory, but I do know that whatever, you know, it's moral bloody background is, it's a fascinating piece of history, and I am very fortunate to have these pieces in my collection. Now, these brooches are set with something called goldstone, and they are, this is not a naturally occurring mineral. It's man-made, and it was, it's, it's first documented in 17th century Venice, but it really took off with a passion with the Victorians. They, they loved this stuff, and they had the kind of refined ways of, of producing it. So it's made of um, copper. Those sparkly things are, are copper. And according to Wikipedia, the initial batch of copper is melted together from silica, copper oxide, and other natural metal oxides to chemically reduce the copper ions to elemental copper. The vat is then sealed off from the air and maintained at a very narrow temperature range keeping the glass hot enough to remain liquid while allowing metallic crystals to precipitate from the solution without melting or oxidizing. After a suitable crystallization period, the entire batch is cooled into a single solid mass that is then broken out from the vat for selection and shaping. The final appearance of each batch is highly variable and heterogeneous, the best material being near the very center or heart of the mass. Ideally, with large, bright metal crystals suspended in a semi-transparent glass matrix, which is exactly what we see here. They are set in a uh, gold, rolled gold or gold-filled setting, and it's this very sparkly, it's quite gaudy, actually. And I, I, I love this. You see this sometimes of micro mosaics being set into gold stone. This is, I think, the definition of Victorian ugly pretty stuff. Looking at that objectively, it's not a very attractive thing, but somehow it works. And they loved kind of pushing the envelope with stuff like this. 
Speaking of micro mosaics, my collection of micro mosaics has gotten larger. Now these range in date from the late 19th century up to relatively modern. This one is quite new. And if you look at the difference in quality between the modern and the Victorian, I mean, it's stark how much more detailed the 19th century one is. This is, I've never actually seen a micro mosaic bracelet before but I thought that was quite cool. And then this is a, a different kind. I'm not even sure if this counts as a micro mosaic, but this is set in some sort of black something. It's missing some malachite in the leaves. I'll figure out how to replace that eventually. But this is a, a style that you see sometimes too of, of mosaic jewelry. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this absolutely stunning micro mosaic brooch. Very clearly something that you would pick up on your grand tour of Italy. On the far left, we've got the Pantheon. And then in the center, we've got the Colosseum. And then I'm not actually sure what that is on the far right. It looks almost like a guillotine, but it, it definitely isn't. If you can figure out what that is on the far right, please let me know. But it's just stunning, the detail of, of the craftsmanship in this. And this is, again, this is something that you would pick up in Italy. It's a tourist thing and it, you know it shows oh look at the places I've been look how cultured I am and odds are if you were wearing it and you'd been there you could tell people about the different places in the scenes I cannot do that because I've never been to Italy and I can't even identify the one on the far right but I just think that it is so incredibly beautiful she also gave me some lovely uh bar pins I love how tiny these two are they could have been for children they also could have been for adults this one is also quite pretty. It's just it's very, very simple marcasites. The most interesting one, though, is this. Now, this type of brooch or of pin has a name. I had thought it was called a scatter pin, but nothing came up when I googled that. So if you know what this is called, please let me know. But it's these three pins that are then connected with chain. And they've all got the same design on them, this little chased design with a tiny little bit of turquoise. But I find this to be such an interesting and creative piece of jewelry. I'm also wondering if there was a specific way or like configuration in which you're supposed to wear the pins because I've not been able to find a way to position it so that the chain isn't sort of draping over top at least one of the pins. So let me know if you have more information on this, on how to wear them and on what they're called. I also picked up a couple of cameos, generally just ones that I thought were interesting in some way. This one is so beautifully carved and, and detailed in its carving. So that's why I picked that one up. These I thought were interesting. They're cuff links and they will eventually go to my boyfriend, but not yet. <laughs> not ready to give them up yet. Um, this one, I thought I was interested in, in the scene depicted. I was wondering if maybe it's supposed to be an 18th century woman wearing large side hoops. Let me know in the comments below what you think. And then this one was interesting because of the setting and it's got this chain here and if you pull here this pops out and I think what you would do is you'd pin this to your collar or whatever and then catch a couple fibers of fabric and then put this back in and that would make sure like even if the clasp failed it wouldn't fall off. It seems like a lot of effort to go to for a brooch that is not made out of gold. The cameo is not very good quality. Uh, and also it kind of deforms the fabric underneath having it pulled up like this. So I have just been wearing it, the, you know, the, the clasp is perfectly fine. So I've just been wearing it like this without using that feature. But I found that feature to be so interesting. If I'm closing it incorrectly, then please let me know. <laughs> this is one singular earring. I took it just on the off chance that I can someday find a match for it. It's very, very unlikely, but a girl can dream. And then some cameo screw back earrings. These are probably not Victorian. They probably date from the thirties, but they still look the part. These earrings, I'm not actually sure how old these are because they seem very Victorian to me, but they could also be reproductions. I'm just, I just don't know. There's a little stamp there. I'm going to put a close-up photograph of that stamp and if any of you can tell me what it says I've not been able to decipher it but these are called intaglios and it's sort of a reverse cameo or the, the cameo is carved in instead of out they've got this way of closing in the back where the hook kind of 
hooks around a thing there, which is a very Victorian thing to do, a very turn of the century thing to do. So I don't know, what do you think? Do you think these are reproductions or do you think they're genuine? Let me know in the comments. This was an interesting pin. It's very rustic looking and I find it quite pretty. It does appear to be Victorian based on the clasp. It's not in the typical Victorian style, which is why I took it because it's, it's, I mean, it appears to be copper and silver and it's just very, it's rustic and it's, it's not classically Victorian. So I found it to be quite interesting. This is another kind of brooch that you see from that era. It's silver with copper and brass sort of inlay, I guess, making this little basket of flowers. And it's actually dated in the back, uh, 1886 to 87, Birmingham, England. This was a very fashionable kind of brooch to wear in the 19th century. The uh, catch has been replaced at some point, but these are garnets. Bohemian garnet was very, very fashionable in the mid to late 19th century. So I've, I've wanted a Victorian boho brooch <laughs> for a while. So I was quite thrilled to find that. Now, this brooch is very interesting. I think that this probably dates from the 1910s or 1920s. And before I show it to you, I need to reiterate to you that this is, this dates from prior to World War II. And if you look in the center, there is indeed a swastika there, which is a symbol of universal peace. It was co-opted by the Nazis to represent their heinous ideologies, but originally it was, it's been used by many different cultures as a symbol of peace. And if you look very closely, you'll see that this one is pointed to the left. The Nazi swastika always pointed to the right. So this brooch has no Nazi ties whatsoever. In spite of that, I do not plan to ever wear it. The Nazis have destroyed that symbol. It's not something I'm ever gonna wear, but I'm gonna keep it in my collection as an interesting piece of history. This is a little locket. And I'm, I'm gonna put photographs up there. It's got, the, the amber types are very faded and difficult to see, but I believe that's an old woman. And then on the other side, We've got a young man, maybe her son, don't know. But what's interesting about this is that when this was made, it would have just been like this. These little doors were not originally part of it. It would have just been worn like this. And then later on in maybe the 1880s, they decided to put these little doors on. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that the pattern on the doors has absolutely nothing to do with the pattern on the actual body of the locket. So they didn't really do a very good job of even matching <laughs> the doors when they added them on. This is an interesting brooch, very artistic. It's gold filled, it's a little enamel cornflower, and then this is a slice of opal. I didn't even know that opal came in slices, but apparently it does. And it, it it's just this like very, very classically Victorian kind of swoosh of nonsense like it, it's not it's it's very abstract but I don't know I just find it I, I just find it quite it's lovely isn't it and then last but certainly not least is this mother of pearl hand set in gold oh, this is my just I so I went over to her house to look through this jewelry the day I finished my last exam. I finished my exam and then went over to her house. And this was just, oh, it was the best way of finishing off law school. I've wanted a brooch like this for such a long time. I was just so, so thrilled to get my hands on this. Look at it. Ah, it's so beautiful. <sighs> All right. So thank you so much, Mary. Um, and once again, I'm gonna leave the Rosehaven website linked down below. Donate if you can, it's a very good cause. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed. And a huge, huge thank you again to everybody who supports this channel on Patreon. You are the reason that I'm able to make these videos and I appreciate you so, so much. If you enjoyed this video, I hope that you are able to stick around and join me for the next one. Bye-bye.